Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for the kind introduction, Jill, and to Don and to CIFAR and OBI for uh, putting together this incredible workshop. I think on behalf of all of the scientists, um, we've had some very stimulating discussions in the first uh, day and a half, and they'll continue into tomorrow. <clears throat> but thank you very much to all of the support for bringing us here and, and getting us to talk about this very fascinating topic. So I s tried to put together a public seminar based on um, 50 years of information, based on information that came out of the uh, the last two days of discussion and some predictions of what might come tomorrow and bring it all into a kind of package to deliver to you today. And what I would like you to take are two primary messages from my presentation this evening. The first is that there is enormous variation in the clinical presentation in autism. There is no such thing as classic autism. Autism is in fact a collection of rare disorders or conditions that share clinical features. Second, there is enormous variation in the genetic factors involved in autism, with dozens of genes now identified to be involved. As I would discuss, understanding the genes and the factors that influence them promise to lead to personalized treatment in autism. This beautiful painting <clears throat> from Tom Thompson, perhaps Canada's most famous artist, offers a good illustration of how, just like the trees in the forest in autumn, each individual with autism is unique, both on the outside and the inside. On the next uh, three slides, I selected six captions from over 50 years of scientific literature on the topic of autism that, in fact, in my opinion, capture the essence of the complexity of understanding the enigma of autism. So, first, uh, the first quote. It all depends on the way you see things, said the woman on the other side of the little table in my office. What can seem like a disability one day can be a talent or a gift on another. The second quote, what is so tragic is that the impairments in social interaction, in communication and in play, at, play at the, uh, strike at the very heart of what it means to be a child. These are quotes from uh, a book that my colleague, Dr. Peter Zatmari from McMaster University, um, used in his book called Understanding Children with Autism and Asperger's Syndrome. I don't think Peter is here tonight, unfortunately, but he is part of the workshop this week. The third quote, an enigma in ASD is the four to one male to female gender bias, which may rise to 11 to one when considering Asperger's Syndrome to be involved. This is from a scientific paper that I'll touch on a little bit later, uh, coming from our group a few years ago. Uh, next, children with a disintegrative disorder show completely normal development until age four, then regress and develop autistic behaviors just like those in autism. And this is a quote from my colleague, a developmental pediatrician, Wendy Roberts, uh, in the Toronto Star just a few months ago. <clears throat> next, people with autism see the forest for the tree, but they see the trees in exquisite detail. And that's from Uta Frith who's a long-standing clinical scientist who studies the phenomena of autism. And next, examination of monozygotic twin pairs concordant for autism show enormous clinical heterogeneity, even when pairs shared exactly the same segregating alleles. And what that means is they share uh, what we expect to be the same genes. And this is from um, Sir Michael Rudder, who's in the audience today, who uh, really has written the book in the history of autism. And I think uh, we stand on his shoulders and others in this audience uh, when we discuss the great advances over the last 50 years. <clears throat> so what is autism? Um, this is how I see autism as a scientist. I like to use Venn diagrams with overlapping circles. <clears throat> but many people think of the child or the individual with autism as someone who is mute, completely self-absorbed, and who sits in a corner and rocks all day. Other common misperceptions are that people with autism are violent and aggressive, and while this can be true, there is in fact enormous variety in how autism presents in individuals. While it's true that many people with autism are not capable of functionally useful language, a substantial proportion, perhaps more than 50%, are able to use language, at least to have their essential needs met. It is also true that the vast majority of children with autism do interact socially with adults, but do so in a limited, unusual, and fixed fashion. 
There is also enormous variation in their cognitive abilities. Some children with autism are able to perform only rudimentary operations, and some will never learn to read. Others, however, are able to perform the most astonishing mathematical calculations or have encyclopedia knowledge of specific topics. Or as Glenn Gould, uh, the, the person named after this theater, uh, could play Bach better than its, its own composer. In spite of the enormous diversity, there are three features that characterize all individuals with autism spectrum disorder. They are <clears throat> impairments, impairments in, social, in reciprocal social interaction, impairments in verbal and nonverbal communication, and a preference for repetitive, solitary, and stereotyped interests or activities. These general, three general characteristics make up the autistic triad. It is also important to point out that the symptoms and behaviors vary with the developmental level and age of the individual and can, have, and can change dramatically over time. But importantly, these changes are usually a variation on the theme already contained in the notion of the autistic triad. This year, the single term autism spectrum disorder or disorders or ASD has come to encompass the um, previous categories of Asperger's disorder, autistic disorder, childhood disintegrative disorder, and pervasive development disorder not otherwise specified. So I will use autism and ASD kind of interchangeably in my presentation. In addition to the autism triad of symptoms, individuals with autism can exhibit many mental health or general health conditions. Most often observed are challenges like attention deficit disorder or attention deficit in 14% of cases, sleep disorder in 15% of cases, learning disability in 22% of cases, depression, 28%, anxiety in up to 45%, digestive system disorders in up to 47%, and brain or spinal conditions, notably epilepsy in 51% of cases. So it is important to point out that in some cases, these conditions may occur with, uh, co-occur with autism, but it is also possible that they could be a result of the autism, for example, sleep disorders, or perhaps even cause the autism itself. Uh, for example, local brain damage caused by epileptic seizures perhaps may induce uh, the autism per se. And this adds yet another layer of complexity when studying the complex enigma that we call autism. And this data was taken from a recently released uh, study in Ontario uh, just in 2013 that had done a very uh, comprehensive survey of these statistics in the Ontario population. <clears throat> now, even more complex are the neuropsychological theories contemplated to explain autism, which are summarized on this slide. And I am no expert at this at all here, <laughs> but let's try to get through it. Two major categories of cognitive theories have been proposed about the links between autistic brains and behavior. The first category focuses on deficits in social cognition. The empathizing system, systemizing theory postulates that autistic individuals can systemize, that is, they can develop internal rules of operation to handle events inside the brain but are less effective at empathizing by handling events generated by other agents. An extension of this, the extreme male brain theory, hypothesizes that the autism, that autism is an extreme case of the male brain. From the evolutionary perspective, this model is based on the idea that males were the hunter-gatherers requiring skills of intense focus. To the contrary, the females who stayed at home acquired genetic traits that favored social interaction and the ability for multitasking. These theories are somewhat related to the earlier theory of mind approach, which hypothesizes that autistic behavior arises from an inability to ascribe mental states to oneself and others. However, most studies have found no evidence for impairment in autistic individuals' ability to understand other people's basic intentions or goals. Instead, data suggests that impairments are found in understanding more complex social emotions or in considering others' points of views. The second category focuses on non-social or general processing, the so-called executive functions such as working memory, planning, and inhibition. A strength of this theory is predicting stereotype behavior in the narrow interests observed in autism. And part of this weak central coherence theory hypothesizes that a limited ability to see the big picture, or the forest, underlies the central disturbance in autism. One strength of this theory is predicting special talents and peaks in performance in autistic people. 
A related theory, enhanced perceptual functioning, focuses more on the superiority of locally oriented and perceptual operations in autistic individuals. In my opinion, and as was pointed out, I'm a geneticist, not a, a neuropsychologist, both theories are in part correct, but maybe not complete. Social cognition theories poorly address autism's rigid and repetitive behaviors, while the non-social theories have difficulty explaining social impairment and communication difficulties. How all of these theories tie together uh, in with the genetics and imaging studies that I will present later needs to be a major area of research in the years to come. As I will allude to at the end of my presentation, a big challenge in the field will be to marry neuropsychological and evolutionary theory if we were to fully understand the complexities of autism. So if I haven't confused you enough, <clears throat> or at least convinced you of the challenges of understanding autism, which is probably the most complex problem that I think one could tackle, uh, this next slide summarizes the complex systems that we'll need to begin to explore in our pursuit to crack the enigma of autism. These include the, the genome, the human genome, the brain, and the human being uh, itself. The genome is the complete set of instructions, the DNA uh, characteristics that you inherit from each of your parents. And this instruction book, or blueprint of your life, is encoded by six billion chemical letters of DNA information. You inherit three billion roughly from your mom and three billion from your dad. Um, encoded by these DNA instructions are 30,000 sets of genes strung along to 23 pairs of chromosomes. And of course, each of these genes is subjected to millions of years of evolution, adding intricate complexities in an experimental process that has built us to what we are today. Next, we have the brain, which is comprised of over 100 billion neurons. These are the brain cells that are comprised of what we call dendrites and dendritic spines and arms, and I'll come back to this a little bit later. These are the, um, the branches uh, uh, or twigs, if you will, that communicate with each other at the synapse of the cell. And if you take these 100 billion neurons, there's over 100 trillion neuronal connections that occur at the synapse. So this is the complexity in the human brain. It's almost unimaginable. There's no computer system, CPU system, that could even be conceptualized that would have the intricate behavior of the human brain. Now, of these 30,000 sets of genes strung along the chromosomes, over 75% of the genes are expressed in the brain. The genome is like a symphony. Um, different parts of the symphony play, the different uh, instruments play at different times during development. There'll be sets of genes that come on during uh, heart development and sets of genes that come on in brain development. And there's many different forms of genes. So these 75% uh, of genes actually could have many different is isoforms. So for example, one of the genes I'll talk about a little bit later, the norexin gene, has a, a thousand different forms uh, that adds even more complexity to this already complex system. And then finally, the human being itself is comprised of trillions of cells. So uh, an average size individual like myself would be comprised of over 60 trillion cells, okay? Uh, and as an individual and as a society, of course, we are defined by the infinite number of experiences and exposures uh, that we experience in our lifetime. And this is, in effect, our environment. And I'll come back to this complexity at the very end of my talk. It's very hard to do experiments trying to measure factors in the environment because it's so complex, much more complex than the brain and the human genome. And we think of the human individual, I show the, the picture of Glenn, Glenn Gould because we're in the Glenn Gould studio here at CBC. Um, I, I like to think of the, the beautiful individuals who can perform classical music, uh, or as Joe pointed out, the Wayne Gretzky's who can score 100 goals in a season. And I also think of my own children who went through the stage of their terrible twos, where you could never predict what they were going to do. And I've heard one parent with a child with autism uh, describe his, his boy as being trapped in his terrible twos 24-7 and multiply that by 100. And this is the type of behavioral situation that we're dealing with in the more severe forms of autism. And as I pointed out earlier, I think it was quite appropriate to put, to, uh, put Glenn Gould's picture on this photograph because um, many people thought that actually he was on the autism spectrum. He had very um, particular habits about how he would sit at his piano and play and uh, what he would eat before performances. And I think there's probably very good evidence that he has Asperger's syndrome. So. Um, these are the complexities that we'll talk about when we're trying to unravel the enigma that we are calling autism. 